Hey everybody, it's Jane Johnston with the Bar Hill Group at Remax Boston, host of Vancouver Island Time and Community Talks Daily at 4.30. Today I'm here with Daintree, Daintree Van Cleef. Daintree is a service-oriented human resource leader that is passionate about creating a dynamic, engaged, and effective workplace culture. She is a dynamic communicator and strategic thinker with more than 20 years of progressive experience in the HR resources field, human resources field, sorry. Um, she's held senior management roles at a number of organizations in both unionized and non-unionized sectors and worked in a variety of industry, including hospitality, manufacturing, marketing, IT, retail, food and beverage, healthcare, and marine repair. Her purpose is to embrace challenge and change, educate and empower those she works with to create a dynamic work culture that can grow with the changing needs of the workplace. So you are the perfect person to be talking to now because we are emerging into the next phase of post COVID craziness. So um, what are you finding right now about creating workplace culture? How important is it? Well, I think the biggest thing I'm finding is is how different it is, right? Some people are referring to, you know, returning to a new normal. And I also think maybe that's not the right word to use because I don't think there's a lot normal about it. And so I think for the first time, there's, you know, there's no rule book, nothing sort of telling people what the right thing is to do. So a lot of uncertainty for sure. So that sort of brings to mind some questions in my mind about well-being. I was actually just speaking with a client about it, about what's going on with people's mental health. Like, are people afraid to be going to work right now? I know teachers have been. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge concern. You know, for the last 12 weeks, everybody has sort of had a big news feed of how big of a risk it is out there and social distance. And, you know, the goal was always to flatten the curve. But I think that got lost somewhere. And so now we're re-entering and nothing's really changed. Uh, the virus is still there. Um, and so how do we kind of proceed and go and feel safe um, out in the workplace, I think is key. And I, I also think, um, you know, there's been a lot of stress in particular professions like healthcare and groceries, for example, and sort of the essential services that stayed open. Um, that I think will create a lot of mental health issues um, once things settle down, for sure. Yeah, and I, what I found, um, so I was talking to a few people about this today, that essentially if we physically distance properly, it's going to feel like nothing happened. If we didn't physically distance, then we would be overwhelmed. So it's one of the two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And as you can see in social media and such, there can be a real range of opinion on that, right? Some people who are, you know, diligent and reporting other people who they don't think are practicing social distancing and some people who really don't think it's that big a deal. And so I think the main thing in the workplace, particularly um, coming in, is how to make the employees coming back feel safe, as well as, you know, if you are providing a service to guests, that they also feel safe. Um, I think safety has to obviously be at the forefront, but also really being mindful of the effects, you know, because there's been so many different things to affect people, right, in terms of, you know, lots of rise in domestic abuse and lots of different things that are happening because of quarantine, um, or people who have young children at home, schools not open, childcare being an issue, you know, there's lots of things to consider as an employer. Yeah. And so I think, you know, one of the key points really is that empathy, right? The listening and the understanding um, that there is a lot of fear coming back to work. And just with anything, when there's a lot of unknowns, like what do safety precautions look like? What will I have to do? Um, will I have to wear a mask? Is that uncomfortable? Um, yeah, and how will guests react and how will they be and will they be patient with us as we learn? And, you know, and for the employers having to learn in real time really quickly what those precautions are and putting together a safety plan, you know, because that's mandated by WorkSafe and I think WorkSafe catching up and putting out all the policy and procedure. I mean, it's a lot of pivoting really quickly. So what kind of 
best practices should we have in place for the post pandemic and re-entry that we're seeing? I think communication is really key. I think looking at, um, you know, what are your practices going to be as you come back to work? Do you know what all the work safe guidelines are for your particular industry? You know, are you keeping up to date with whether or not you're impacted by BC health guidelines as well? Um, you know, what areas are high risk in your workplace? Um, what items do you need to address and having that communication with your employees because they'll ask all those questions. They'll want to know what the employers are doing to keep them safe um, and what does that look like. And so I think it's really communication is huge, uh, deciding on what that communication platform will be. So how are you going to communicate with your employees because things are changing and because even the precautions change. And so how do you update them in real time? Um, I think also really managing people's feelings um, and concerns is going to be a big part of the workplace uh, because you can't sort of beat that with logic or, you know, I think there's so a lot of listening, a lot of communication will be really important. Um, you know, developing, developing clear policies in terms of, you know, how will you treat if you have an employee that might get COVID-19 or a guest if you're perhaps in the hotel industry, what does that look like? Um, you know, will you supply personal protection equipment? Will it be, you know, mandated in your place? Are you doing temperature checks? And if you are, do you have someone qualified to do that, right? So all of these things to consider in terms of, but I think it's really key to communicate and also to communicate what the consequence will be if those safety practices aren't followed. I don't think people have thought that through. I think we're all just concerned as that, you know, are you wearing a mask and washing your hands? They're not saying. What if you yeah. don't? Well, and isn't that just the key? You know, I look at all of these people, particularly, you know, as grocery stores being open and, you know, lots of young people who work in grocery stores who are now being required to have the skills to manage a crowd and to, you know, tell them they can't stand there or they have to follow the arrows, like the skills that they didn't know, have to have prior checking them in and out. Um, and so, I think that's really stressful. There's a lot of stress on the employee now that wasn't there previously. And so with that, again, we go back to mental health because that can cause some issues. And so for leaders, it's a, you know an unprecedented time for them and how to, not only are they managing all those administrative tasks and coming up, but managing things probably they didn't have a lot of skill in prior. Yeah, um, we we're talking today about EQ. Um, in a meeting that I was in, I've been in a lot of meetings around leadership lately um, and just trying to figure out what, what skills people need as a leader. One is flexibility, one is the big vision, uh, the empathy, um, being humble in knowing what you don't know, asking for help. That's where you come in, right? Absolutely. Asking for help. I mean, being a leader at best of times is a really tough role, right? And I think, you know, being a leader in this time of uncertainty is all of those things you said. Also, a lot, probably a lot more listening than they're used to doing. Asking a lot of questions um, and getting a lot of feedback from the community or the organization they're working in will be really key. And as you said, that empathy piece, so that emotional intelligence will become a really needed skill, right? Understanding what their own limitations are, what their own triggers are, um, and taking care of themselves. You know, their own self-care will be so important and filling up sort of their own buckets, if you will. Yeah, this is just, it's just so interesting how things all come together. So um, who is your ideal client then right now? Who is my ideal, sorry? Client. Uh, I think, you know, typically a small to medium business who, you know, might not have many enough employees that would warrant a full time HR person. Um, and so they're needing that skill and that help to sort of navigate typically communicating with employees, getting feedback from employees and sort of establishing that culture. Um, and also just in terms of legislation, I think HR can be really helpful. Um, in terms of recalling employees, right? We have lots of employees that were laid off and now being called back to work. What does that look like? Um, so I think, you know, mostly clients or clients who might have in-house HR, um, but need a lot of help facilitating some training and leadership for leaders. Because I think one of the things I'm really passionate about 
is opening the conversation to mental health and wellness in the workplace um, and being really proactive about that. And so that's something that can be really uncomfortable uh, to have those conversations. So I think sometimes it's helpful to have somebody outside the organization maybe facilitate some of those conversations. And it may be also a time to re-identify skills of your employees and um, look at where else they could be placed because you might have somebody who at this time is a great listener and can step into leadership or, you know, is good at crowd control or um, has a naturally calm demeanor. Absolutely. Like really looking at where people shine. It may not be within what they were hired for and kind of reassessing that and having them, you know, step up to those strengths. I think that's a big piece of sort of crisis management, right? We were all taken aback by this. Nobody had a pandemic real plan in place, right? And so I think that's another key piece as we reopen because, you know, it's likely there may be a second wave. And so looking how you can create that crisis sort of culture within your organization um, so that you might be better equipped to pivot the next time it happens. Yeah, so I was wondering about that. So now it's happened once, it may happen again. Obviously, it's going to create less stress. I know it stressed me out. <laughs> and um, I have been deliberately, I just met with and I've been deliberately uh, not approaching them about moving forward with real estate because I feel I felt before it wasn't the time and it wasn't safe and it's safer now and with the incidents being so low. Um, I, I didn't want to put anybody at risk. So, but what happens when it happens again? Um, I think we're going to pivot faster. But do you think we need to have a plan, plan in place to yeah. reinstitute things? Like here's, here's stage A. What is it? DEFCON 1 to DEFCON 5? That's right. And I think, you know, I think it's old school to sort of have a pandemic plan, right? We'll have a little binder and we'll put it on the shelf, right? I don't think that's yeah. what this workforce or the pandemic requires because as we've seen, it's like, go out, don't go out, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Like there's so much happening in real time, right? So I think it's more about creating kind of a crisis ready culture where you're opening up conversations with your employees. If you do have in-house HR, you know, really that's a critical resource to manage the information and feedback from the employees they serve to the leadership so they can make informed decisions. I think a really key thing coming back once they've made their safety plans and sort of done all the things to open would be to do sort of a lessons learned, right? On what what didn't work well when everything happened, you know, what weren't you prepared for and what could you do next time? And But keep the conversation going and not only have it um, when there's a pandemic. I think that's an important piece. I think it's an important piece to really encourage dialogue and um, maybe disagreements and sort of having that safe place, right? Because I think innovation too is gonna be really key in workplaces going forward. And, you know, right now people, a lot of organizations may spend maybe 10% of their time on that. Um, so like a, like a Socratic type of methodology where you reach consensus sort of thing? It, yeah, I mean, I mean, you may not always, <laughs> consensus but I think just asking a lot of what if questions right like in terms of crisis manage what if we do have a second wave what if we do have an employee who becomes effective how will we handle that with the rest of our workforce you know will we have rotating work schedules so that there are teams that don't see each other so if that occurs then we still have a team that wasn't in contact right like all of those types of questions to ask yourself um, and I think that helps alleviate the fear to right in people returning and knowing that safety is sort of first and foremost. It's funny. So I've just been thinking a lot about languaging. So when this started, we talked about pivoting and protocols and we're sort of all very scientific. But what I'm hearing from you is now it's time to sort of bring out the softer side where um, we're helping people recover, A, and B, we're helping them to move forward. And the way to do that is to listen, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think that, you know, for me anyways, watching, you know, and I most recently work in hospitality, right, and tourism, which has been hardest hit in terms of closures and something I've never seen in my lifetime. Um, and so really being 
cognizant of that and that these are things people have never experienced. And so I think for the guests going into the new reopen restaurants, you know, there's going to require a lot of patience from them too, in terms of trying to fall, you know, help by following the protocol. And maybe you're not going to get your meal as fast as you once did and prices may be more expensive, uh, those types of things. And so, yeah, I think definitely that sort of dogma and even HR of yesterday, you know, where we had all these sort of inflexible policy and procedure, I think that's going to change as well. Like, you know, maybe you have some employees who have no childcare and don't want to come back and you grant, a, you know, a leave of absence without pay, which you might not have done previously. Because um, yeah. I've seen amazing things of pivoting, especially in food and beverage and, you know, restaurants, there's a restaurant in New York who, you know, used their pizza oven to build, you know, face shields and like awesome. there's been really amazing things restaurants here locally uh, locally owned restaurants who have created you know grocery shops and you know cocktails and liquor like you can sort of yeah i've been really amazed at how quickly they sort of reacted and created something new to keep their business alive well um so we've been doing a lot of work with uh, in our group about personalities and responses to different situations and one of the things you're mentioning is it's very procedural what you're talking about and certain people respond well to that but to other people you you really have to take into account who you're talking to how they're going to take in the information and process it because, uh, so, some people may just be very well turned off by it all are you finding that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fear creates different reactions, right? You'll have some people that just, you know, we're going to sort of stick our head in the sand and it's not happening. And I'm, you know, there's so many ranges of emotions. And so I think what will be really important for leaders is sort of how to spot that in the workplace, right? Somebody that may be struggling, what does that look like? So it may look like, you know, there's tardiness or they're calling in sick, or it may look like they need more supervision than they have previously, or their work is inconsistent. Uh, or they're quick to anger, right? People who have a really quick, uh, what we would think, wow, that person's kind of making a big deal out of nothing. That's a really good sign that someone's coping strategies are max. Like there's nothing more there. Um, and recognizing that, you know, um, it's then hard to have a conversation with somebody in that state. So I think for leaders, that's a lot, right? There's a lot of things to learn about how to spot it and then how to help that person and support them in that type of situation. So, so we've gone through the pandemic. We haven't yet, but <laughs> we will have gone through the pandemic. Yeah. And one of the one of the factors. So what I'm. It's interesting because I did a report today on the market, and I called it a bounce. The market did a bounce and came right back up. So that says to me that it. Is a degree of resilience in there. How do we create resilience in um, other businesses? Yeah, it's interesting. I attended um, a conference, and one of the speakers was a was an economist, and he also, you know, sort of showed graphs and numbers and sort of some bounce back. And you know, it was more encouraging um, than I sort of thought in terms of bounce back. Um, and I think. You know, in terms of particularly in hospitality and tourism, right? Like we're looking probably at 12 to 18 months before there's any kind of upswing there because of, you know, because the summer is the only time usually to make all that's their season and cruise ships and all of those things have been closed. So um, I think it's looking at new ways that you can generate revenue. Um, like some of the things I was saying that I'd seen in other restaurants, you know, trying to changing. Interesting enough, you know, there was a restaurant in Vancouver who prior to the pandemic went then went to just delivery and takeout. And so while their liquor sales were down, um, sort of their overall sales down, their revenue, their profit margins were similar um, because not as many, you know, a big restaurants, so not as many staff labor costs and other things. So. I think it's just looking at a lot of different ways on how you can protect yourself better. Because as you saw, lots of, I mean, there were big companies, you know, two big operators in the UK that have been around for a hundred years um, that didn't survive being shut down for a couple months. Who were they? 
Fortnum and Mason or something like that? I can't remember the name now. One, I think, was like a tour bus type of company. Um, yeah, so just surprising, right, how unprepared, like, just I think that's another thing to look at in terms of our resources. Um, because, you know, there were a lot of people that just, especially restaurants, right, there's no margin there in terms of lots of profit. So, yeah, I think looking at new ways to be able to survive. So one of the things Danielle brings up is, so I think the way businesses have adapted have helped strengthen employer, employer and employee relationships. Companies that dumped all their employees unnecessarily may find them not so trustful on a second COVID wave. She's not talking to me, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's so true. And um, you know what though? Those companies didn't value their people pre-COVID, right? I mean, that, you know, the companies who put people first are still putting people first. Like I've been amazed at how many companies have done whatever they can to keep, you know, like uh, my brother worked for a company that did alternating work schedules, you know, so they had two different teams. They were still paid for the whole week and really amazing things. And um, as it should be in my HR heart, people should, you know, they're the most important asset. And so I think the relationships are changing. Um, and strengthen, and I really see a sense of community being really strengthened too. Like so many people that, like I've been part of groups and, you know, helping some of my clients, you know, free of charge, just supporting everybody. Like that's been real, really nice to see. Are you finding there's collegiality, increased collegiality between people in the same industries? Like I'm thinking for the um, hotel industry, you know, there could be a dine around. I'm thinking there are going to be more tourism within Canada. Um, I think probably there's going to be in real estate, there's going to be more rural property purchasing. Like there's going to be different trends happening. What trends do you see happening? Yeah, I, I de well, I see a few trends, not particularly in hospitality. I see more remote working for sure, working from home, not obviously in hospitality because that's not possible. You have to be on the premises. Um, and I also see, um, priority shifting in terms of the workplace, right? Like people coming back with, you know, it was amazing when you're quarantined, how many things you didn't really need that you were doing. And so I think that will affect the workplace too. What do we, it's a time to really be able to say, what do I want to take back? And what do I yeah. want to not do anymore? Yeah. Um, and I think communities, like I've seen hospitality professionals really rally, like lots of task force. You know, you talked to Peter last week, the BCFRA has done tremendous work to try and support the restaurants and rally for them and provide resources. And so I see a lot of camaraderie and people helping each other. And are you seeing, um, so actually what you're saying is interesting because I think at the beginning of this, I was focused on uh, figuring out where my money was going, what's necessary, what's unnecessary, and then cutting the fat, literally. Um, being loyal to employees so that we have a continuum because it's just we, first of all they need to know whether or not they're going to be employed in the long run and you value them um, but also just the retraining of everybody uh, that's just a huge cost that people leave don't you think oh it is so expensive to lose people for so many reasons right and so, you know, with everything that's happening, you know, I know so many organizations, right, have no more training budget, like they've had to cut all of their costs, right? But there's so many things you can do that are of little cost. Um, and a lot of that's about your relationship building and your culture and using the resources you have within and maybe seeing people in a different light and different, like we were talking earlier, different talents that they might have to offer. Um, and so I see things being a lot more collaborative um, then sort of that top down. I don't. I, I think the top down structure was on its way out, anyways. But I think this has given it a serious. You know, it's really leveled the playing field, right? So, do you think? Um, just last question. Do you think, in terms of technology, we've really jumped ahead skill level? I think about five or ten years. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, we had to get really quick with Zoom and all the functions. I mean, you know, as I said, my the. CPHR BC Yukon went to online networking events via Zoom. I mean, it's been amazing how people have stepped up and yeah, it's been quick learning for sure. Okay, so 
Thank you very much for coming to speak with us today. It's actually been really, really great. I've enjoyed chatting with you. If you guys want to get in touch with Daintree, you can. She is at Daintree Van Cleave Consulting at Shaw.ca, or you can call her at 250-818-1169. That's Daintree, D-A-I-N-T-R-Y, Van Cleave with an E on the end, Consulting. Thank you so much for coming out today and being a part of the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jane. It was great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. No problem. Tomorrow we're going to have Avery Brown. She's with the Vancouver, oh my God, I keep saying it, Victoria Hospital Foundation. I'm going to be on at 4.30. It's very important that we support our hospital, so I'm interested to hear what she has to say and how we can help her. And if you have a friend or know somebody who should be on the show who wants to get a shout out, please put them in touch with me. We'd love to have them. Don't forget to go to our YouTube channel and like us so that we can do more on YouTube for you. All right. See you tomorrow. All right. And take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.